first time I realised there was something badly wrong in Bristol was actually on the first day that I worked there. Um, and I did a day of paediatric cardiac surgery with James Wishart. And the two cases that we did that day would normally have taken probably a morning at the Brompton Hospital. And I didn't get home until after nine o'clock at night. So on my first day, uh, there were... I won't say alarm bells ringing, but I, I could see flags being waved about the duration of the operations. When you're operating on the heart, you're cutting off the blood supply to the heart and it starts to die. And obviously the longer you take when there is no blood supply to the heart, then the less likely the heart is to work well after the operation. So time is crucially important in paediatric cardiac surgery. That was something that I'd learnt at Great Ormond Street and the Brompton hospitals. And in Bristol, time didn't seem to be important. These operations were taking much, much longer and the children were in much worse condition afterwards. We were mortified, everybody, the whole team, um, particularly the theatre nurses, obviously, who were laying out children on the operating table, were just desperately unhappy with that outcome whenever it occurred. It, it's not what they'd been paid to do. It's not what they saw their job as. And they, like me, were aware of the fact that things could be better and they wanted things to be better, and they wanted somebody to try and do something about it. When I had first written to John Roylance uh, in 1990, um, one of the responses had been that Mr Wishart had asked me to see him in his office. He had told me in no uncertain terms that this was not the way to deal with an issue in paediatric cardiac surgery. And if I took steps like that again to raise the issue with him, then my future in Bristol would be curtailed. It was a very clear threat and I have absolutely um, no doubt uh, what was intended by that meeting. I was still raising issues internally as late as 1992. There was then a period in which we were gathering more data to try and prove the case irrevocably that this unit should stop doing the dangerous operations. By 1995, I had told the Director of Cardiac Services and also um, the Professor of Surgery, who was a senior clinician within the organisation. My plan was to tell as many people as I could uh, and, um, and just to let them know. But they were all people within the profession. Um, this, was, this was something that, um, uh, that just had to be got out there. Whenever I hear of these problems of people who legitimately raise concerns with CEOs and medical directors who not only don't take any notice but actually actively undermine the people who are raising the concerns, my initial response is huge disappointment because what it's likely to end up in is unnecessary deaths of patients in the health service. And I've been through enough of that to know that that's not a pleasant experience. And it's even worse for the relatives of the people that are involved. So huge disappointment. And then I think my secondary response is just a lot of anger. And I direct my anger at the people who are taking responsibility for the performance of the health service. And that's not the patients, it's sometimes the doctors, but it's actually the people at the top of the NHS 
who are completely failing to take any kind of accountability for what are persistent and unacceptable failings in their organisation. They wouldn't survive in a toy shop, but they survive in the NHS.